So you've made all that sweet dough murkin, and now you're ready to take another step up the ladder of power. But are you? Let's take a moment to go over the pre-vassal checklist. Do you have a vetted out personal army? Is your personal drip complete to include good armor for your good boy? Are your companions sporting the weapons of mass destruction they need? And do you have a fat stack of dinars that you can roll around in and sprinkle all over those tavern maids? If you answer no to any of these questions, you need to stay in mercenary mode. Mercenary phase is where you build your wealth. Vassalage is where you build your power. But if you're ready to take the leap, the next question is, who do you become a vassal for? This is where some of the cracks in Bannerlord begin to show. If you vassal for the kingdom you want, it's a nightmare to take any fiefs within that kingdom. There are mechanics where you can try to put a fief up for vote, but it doesn't work well. And it's damn near impossible to gain a good fief this way. Your only hope is that one of your faction's towns gets taken over and then you can recapture it. But waiting around for that to happen can suck. This mechanic needs to be improved and expanded to include extortion blackmail, civil wars, and assassinations. But since all we ever seem to get are bug fixes these days, let's focus on being practical. Of course, you can use mods, but out of deference to our console family, I'm going to leave those out. The best way to get the fiefs that you want is to just take them. So, if you want Valandian lands, you probably don't want a vassal for Valandia. You need to sign up with one of their enemies. This sucks so freaking bad, and it just crushes that beautiful thematic playthrough. People will tell you to throw javelins into the king until he dies or some other cheesy tactic. And I won't judge. Let he who has never saved scummed cast the first stone. I just don't prefer those methods. The only exceptions to this rule can be the Batanians or the Sturgeons. They get rolled consistently enough that sometimes you can vassal up and help restore the kingdom which is just great. However, even if you do that, you can't carry those achievements into some way to cause division within your faction or challenge the king's rule. Okay? This just sucks. It just sucks. All that said, the easiest way to get what you want is to take it. In this scenario, I ran a Byzantine Empire playthrough, and so I knew I wanted some Empire towns that were on the eastern border, and here the southern empire has two delicious towns ready for the taking. The best way for me to take these is not, unfortunately, going to be helping the southern empire. It's going to be for me to join the northern empire and then come take them myself. And that's just the reality of where Bannerlord is at this time. So I'm going to come over here to the northern empire faction leader, I think Daddy Lucon died. Yeah, we're down to Assyrian now. So you pledge allegiance to the Emperor for a season. And then you get started building up your influence. Now that you're a vassal, the influence you gain is no longer converted into cash, but it's kept as a new form of currency. There's a ton of ways to gain influence from kingdom policies to buildings within your fiefs. There's just a ton of ways to do it. But the two main ways to do it, especially when you're first starting out as a vassal, is to win battles and if you capture enemy lords, donate those lords as prisoners. They'll give you a ton of influence. 
And you can build up a nice amount of influence very quickly doing those two things. When it comes to spending influence, the first and most important thing influence will allow you to do is build giant armies to help you take those fiefs you desire. So you can see this would cost me 95 influence to put this army together. And I don't have that yet, but it won't be long if I get out there and start kicking ass. Once you gather enough influence to build that big army you need to take the fief that your heart so desires, then what you want to use that influence for, once you capture the fief, it gets put to a vote. So you hit OK, and here you can spend different levels of influence to further increase the chance that the vote goes in your favor. Now, in this case, I'm very likely to get this fief because it's already in my favor. So spending an extra 70 influence to get four more percent, probably not worth it. But sometimes you're at 39, 49 percent, and sometimes that large chunk of influence can tilt the vote in your favor just enough to let you get your hands on that prize. But in this case, we can just save the influence. We hit done and there it is. I get my first town. Now remember, whoever's in charge of the faction can and will often bend you over despite what everybody voted. He can rule in someone else's favor and give it to someone else and that will happen. And you can either just take it or use it as a motivation to break out on your own. And so that's how influence works. You build it up and then you spend it to build big armies and take territory for your clan. A little tip here, by the way, if you don't know this, is that you see that I have a tournament in here and I've brought my big ass army into this town. If I go into this town and go into the arena. See, I have 16 lords ready to join and I can get a really nice helmet. And this is where you're going to get those really nice horses, those really nice weapons. Honestly, this is another thing they need to address. I think the prizes should be better. And I believe there should be some legendary weapons, especially with like in this situation where you've got 16 lords. I think the prize should just be incredible. Because these are you know, hard to win. Uh, not for some of you. Some of you are gods of the arena. But for those of us that are a little more in our prime, sometimes these can be rather challenging. Now, there's a lot that goes into fief management. So what I'm going to do is make it its own separate video as part of this series. This one, I'm just going to talk about vassalage. But I will make a fief management video that covers all this stuff. Uh, and maybe some things that you weren't so aware of and how it all works and my recommendations and all that. Of course, I'll do that for you because you're my YouTuber. So we'll do the fief management video separate where I'll go into all of this. I will, however, cover fief defense because no army lasts forever. Your cohesion's going to run out and these guys are going to split off and they're going to go to other parts of the empire, wars on the other side of Calrati are going to pop off and you're going to be stuck here alone. So we'll go ahead and kick the army out. And you can see once you disband the army, they take off pretty quick to go do other things. And you're left here by your lonesome. This is where influence as a currency becomes very important. And I like to keep farming and keep up a high level of, of influence because in this case, eventually the Asarai and the Kazade or whoever are going to start bringing those big 800 plus man armies around and you can fight them in a siege. However, that's a little more risky. What I like to do is I just use this influence to build big armies to help defend my fief. I always like to keep five to 600 influence in case I need to throw together a giant army to come help save my territory. And the reason you're going to want to save a pile of influence to do that is because you see here, if I go to recruit an army right now, 
there's a limited amount, a pretty good amount right now, but sometimes your faction will have two or three armies in the field and you won't be able to pull that many people to you. Well, you can break that army apart, but that's going to cost you 30 influence right off the top. If you have to break two armies apart to come help you with a 12, 1500 man Asarai, Valandian, or Kazaid army, well, then you're probably going to need to summon the entire Imperial Legion, right? So we'll disband that army and it costs you a little relation. But if you capture lords and put them back in their castle, whatever fiefs he owns in the dungeon, you'll build your rep all the way up. You can see I'm already at 100. It'll go right back up. Plus, just winning big battles and stuff will help build up uh, your reputation. And there's leadership perks and all that. So don't worry about the relationship hit too much. And let's be honest, relationship's kind of a weak mechanic in this game. So don't worry about that. But now I come in here, I sort by cost, so I get the cheapest first. And now look, I could put together a hell of an army to come and save the day should I need it. So it's always good to have a nice stack of influence to fall back on because yes, sometimes you can win those amazing siege battles, but if you're not going to save scum, it can be a risky proposition, especially when you get into castles and things like that and those big enemy armies. I mean, sometimes they can just, through attrition, I've lost sieges that I thought for sure I was going to win. Uh, you just never know. So why leave it to chance? You work so hard to take it. You've got the influence. Spend it. Spend it if you got it, boys. There's no reason for you to go fight an army of five, 600 with your elite troops and take horrific casualties. Grab some lords. Especially, I mean, You can spend two, 300 influence and really boost up your numbers. And then your troops aren't taking all those casualties. Plus, those bigger battles you win generate huge amounts of influence. So you're kind of in a feedback loop at that point. You're going to gain some of what you spent back. And then as you mop up the forces that are weakened now, you're just going to gain more and more. So you are going to be swimming in influence if you're at all active on the map. Spend it if you got it. But now take a quick peek at this situation. I'm out here on an island by myself. And if I don't want my villages to get raided and my town to get taken, I kind of need to hang out in this area because the enemy tends to target the newer fiefs and most certainly the fiefs that it's lost. And so it's very likely that the empire is going to start sending armies, both big and small, to raid my villages or take back this town. And what you'll have to be careful about is at some point, we'll declare peace with this faction, right? And then they're going to declare war up here on the Batanians or the Sturgeons or the Western Empire. And you're going to want to go over there to get that your farm on. And if you don't have enough money, you may have to just to stay afloat. And you don't want to be in that position because what's going to happen is you're going to be over here and battle after battle. And then all of a sudden, Southern Empire is going to declare war, put together a 1,600-man army, and they're going to lay siege to your town. And possibly before you get back and are able to put together a big army, they're going to take it back. And you don't want that to happen. And so this is how I handle my first fief defense. I hang around in the area. I protect my villages, let my town breathe and get built up. If a giant army comes, I spend my fat stack of influence to summon my own army, and I like to handle it in the field, especially if I'm the commander of the army, because then you get say over everybody, and that makes it awesome and very likely that you're going to have a victorious outcome. But if I feel like that 1,700-man army is just going to lay siege, build a battery ram, and hit the walls, then what I'll do is I'll hop inside here, and I'll go ahead and still summon that army. And then what will happen is while they're laying siege and the siege is going back and forth and they're taking damage, your army will start to gather outside of here and they'll be right outside. And there's a chance that you could sally out and take them out. Or if they attack the walls and you get them to retreat and you've basically cut their number in half, well, now you can sally out and attack that half of army that they would actually just go ahead and retreat with. Well, now you can just go ahead and annihilate all of it uh, because your army's waiting right outside the walls. 
the main point is spend your influence to build armies to do what you want. Take fiefs, defend fiefs, win huge battles to get more money. The whole point of the vassal phase is to continue to build your clan's wealth and also greatly increase its power. Now, when we talk about clan strength here, and this is something you want to increase, what this accounts for is it accounts for your troops and your garrisons. Fast forward a little bit, and I've taken Danustica, Onira, Carinia Castle, and Odrissa Castle, although I didn't win the vote on Odrissa, which sucked. But I've still got these three fiefs now, and I'm raking in the dough. Another great thing I like to do in the vassal phase, going back to talking about building those big armies and preparing your clan to step out on its own, and declare your own kingdom is, on top of your own party, you can have companions lead other parties for your clans. Now, this is where the game can just dramatically change between console players and PC players. Now, you guys know I always try to be considerate of my console family, and it just sucks that you guys can't use mods. But I have to give a shout out to Party AI Controls by Carbon. If I ever get my hands on this guy, I'm probably going to sexually assault him. Uh, but at least I told you guys. So I think that counts as consent. This mod is just amazing. And it makes the game so enjoyable. Especially if you love those nice thematic playthroughs that I'm always preaching about. When it comes to creating parties, it addresses some major deficiencies in the vanilla version of the game. And if you have the ability to mod your game, this is one mod I would very much suggest that you get. The problem with creating clan parties in vanilla is what's going to happen is you're going to create these parties and what they're going to do is they're just going to run off because some lord of your faction is going to recruit them into their big army and they're just going to get crushed over and over. And then they get captured and then you have to wait for them to return to you and then you create another party and then they go out and get captured again. And that's just the cycle. Now they do gain levels and every once in a while they have some success, but for the most part, it's just that same get captured, return, remake the party, get captured, return, remake the party and it just sucks bring in party AI controls, and now you have a lot more say over what your parties do. So in this case, this is Nadia. She's going to help boost up my personal legion by having her own Imperial Legion set. And look, I can come down here and I can edit her party composition right here. 40% infantry, 30% archers, 30% cav. Save that. And that's the Imperial Legion template. Her army is going to consist of that. And I can even select the type of infantry, the type of archers. So in this case, I had her choose Palatine Guard because that's what I like in my field army. I like crossbows for defense, but in the field army, give me those double quivered Palatine Guards and Cataphracts. And so that's what her army is going to consist of. Now, you know, there'll be various levels and quality, but they will be those troop types. And when I bring them in, her 130 will complement my 300. So now I'll have a 430 Legion that mimics my own army. On top of that, in this playthrough, I played it so that I made friends with a Rebel Kazate Nomad faction, and they're going to provide me horse archers. Well, look how cool this is. I edit his party composition, 100% horse archers, and I made him cons guard. Now, remember, I have to pay for these parties. You, these come out of your pocket. But when I call these parties to my army, they're going to bring in the troop types that I've designated. So if you're looking to build that giant heathen army of sturgy and heavy axemen, or you want to all horse archer army, or you want to build that nightmare pure Fian army, whatever it is, you can edit your party compositions. And this allows you to do it even if for your faction, if you're king. On top of that, in the options up here, I can select what activities I do or do not want them participating in. So when I say may join armies, no, you may not. I don't want you donating the troops I'm paying for to other people's garrisons. I'll handle my garrisons and the other lords can handle theirs. It's not my job to fund the empire's garrisons. 
I don't want them laying siege to stuff and getting captured. I let my Kazate army raid because I feel like that's, you know, they're going to want to do that. My second party here full of Imperial troops, I don't let them raid. You can let them buy horses to increase their move speed. And then here, if they don't have an order, I can give them a fallback order to patrol my territory and make sure there's no giant bandit parties or people raiding my villages. And as a final cherry on top of this mod, if my party leaders do happen to lose a battle and get captured, as soon as they're out of captivity, they will automatically recreate that party, recruit it back up to capacity, and start training those troops up. And I don't have to constantly go around, recreate the party, and do all that. I can just let it go, and they can just be those independent commanders that I expect them to be. This mod is absolutely fantastic, and I can't say enough about it, how we weep for our console brothers who cannot add these things to their game because it just enriches the play so much. I can't thank Carbon enough, but if I ever find him in a food court somewhere, I plan to. If you are on console, you have two options. You can create these parties and immediately recruit them to your army so that other people can't recruit them. You'll build your leadership and you'll have these parties when you need them. The only problem, of course, is you're going to be a lot slower. And so sometimes chasing down those smaller armies trying to raid can be a pain. The other option is to wait to create your extra parties until you declare your own kingdom. Because at least at the beginning, before you have other lords in your faction, you're the only one that can create armies. And so they're not going to get snatched up and taken from you. And they'll just roll around your territory and do what you want. But you won't be able to give them orders. You won't be able to dictate their composition. It just, it sucks. Just be aware, without the AI party controls mod, your mileage may vary on party creation because they might be out doing all types of shit when you need them most. And can I just say, console players need mods. Console players need mods. Whatever the coding or whatever needs to be done, it needs to be done because console players need access to mods. They should be able to enrich their game the same way that PC players are. I'm sure that's a lot more complicated than I understand, but it needs to happen. And that should cover the key points to living your best life as a vassal. And in your free time, you can lounge around and consider if that faction leader of yours is really worth all that loyalty. I'm not so sure. Oklahoma out. <laughs>